Steve Basic Architect. Yeah, welcome back. So, continuing on with our PH11 series. Yeah, this is episode number four. If you haven't seen the first three, go back. Everything's coordinated inside a playlist, so you can just go to a playlist and watch this whole series if you miss something. So, go check it out. We're talking about passive house that I designed in 2009, got built in 2010, and certified in 2011 as a certified passive house. At that time, remember 2011, that's uh, that certification well over 12 years ago, and there was but maybe a handful. I want to say this was probably like the fourth or fifth passive house in the country at the time. Um, and Passive House, remember, deals with super insulation, and we talked a little bit about that in episode three, actually at some length there, and thermal breaks and such. Today we're going to talk about the other aspect of Passive House, and that is the air tightness, right? The air tightness, which plays a big role. I think one of the positive things that passive house when it came to America and brought it was the fact that it really moved air sealing and air tightness to the forefront of our understanding and con what should be concerns when we're building because honestly it's low hanging fruit most of the time to get air sealing done but it also has probably one of the bigger impacts I mean everything you know, has an impact when it's systematic, like the design of a passive house. But air tightness is certainly a uh, very important part of that. So, um, yeah, I said it. Steve Basic Architect got the Vibe board here in action. Right, teamed up with Vibe and contributor on the Build Show and a co-host on the Unbuild It podcast. If you're looking for me in other places, so. Building section. Episode three, we talked about a building section two where we talked about insulation. This is the short um, short way as opposed to the longitudinal section in the other one. And like I said, we're, today we're going to talk about air tightness. And for that, let's uh, go to red. Um, so the red line. Basically, the red line test. And that's attributed to Dr. Joe. Those of you not familiar with Joe, I'm speaking of Joe Stiebrick at Building Science Corporation. Um, go Google it. Um, you'll find out who he is in a hurry um, when you Google it because you probably don't have enough lifetimes to uh, understand what Joe has accomplished in his one lifetime. Um, but anyways... The red line test, right? Joe would stipulate that we should be able to take a building section anywhere in the building, anywhere. Doesn't matter, you could do it crazily, diagonally across a building, doesn't matter. The thing that the red line test is looking for is one of my favorite words, continuity, right? Continuity, and you've heard me say it before, is the key to success. It's the key. So, what is the red line test? Well, it means that I should be able to go down trace a building and most importantly It should close. It should close and it should be continuous. So I should be able to do that red line test around the building. Close it. Like I said, doesn't matter where. It's without exception. This I'm going to draw in blue. There is 
no, and I know I gotta write this out, but it's interesting how even when I write it out, how many people I go around the country and they try and uh, tell me how there's exceptions to the red line test. There are no exceptions to the red line test. It should be one continuous line and it should close. Two rules. Now, what that red line test establishes, no matter where I go, draw a line there, I'll draw a line here, and I'll draw a line here. What it's suggesting is there should be an in and an out. An in and an out. An in and an out. Now, I know you're saying, Steve, enough with the ins and the outs. Like, you're boring me. Well, sorry for that. But I can't tell you this very simple concept of whether I'm either inside or I'm outside of the building is so hard for people to wrap their heads around. Right? It isn't. Um, you know, one of... One of my favorite comments from Joe was always, it's not rocket science, it's building science, right? And we tend to want to complicate things because if we complicate things and then we solve them, we look like a genius. But the real genius is in what Joe would do in simplifying the problem from the get-go and so that the problem was easily understood and easily solved for. So my point here is, don't make this complicated. Don't make it more complicated than it is. Understand, at any given point, I should be able to put myself anywhere on this drawing, and I can understand, am I inside the building or outside the building? Now, there are some areas where, okay, if I, if I put myself in the attic, right, am I in or out of the building? Well, technically, I'm inside the building because I'm in the attic. But we're not talking about that. We're talking relative to the reference line of our big or our red line test, right? And so, given our red line test here, I am clearly outside the building. The in and out, right? That continuity, that in and out, what we're really talking about there is condition space. And condition space, for those of you not in the industry, condition space is the space that I heat and cool, right? That I buy energy to either provide air conditioning or heating, depending on where I am, what season it is, what time of year um, in the country, and developing that condition space. Um, so, pressing on. If we buy all this, which we should because there's no magic here, there's no lies here, this is pretty simple, um, very uh, easily understood, and don't complicate things. So, Passive House, now, they require 0 0.06 air changes per hour, ACH, at 50 pascals. Scales is just a unit of pressure. And that's the number, the target number, that we're shooting for. Now, remember, 2011, this is certified, built in 2010. I was, the builder here was a builder who had never done anything above Energy Star um, because it really didn't exist in America at the time. Um, me being the architect, I had some knowledge of what I was doing from virtue of working at Building Science Corporation and alongside Joe and Betsy for years, but the reality was there was still less than a handful of passive houses in the country. And here we are, we're signing up to the homeowner and saying, oh yeah, we could do that, right? At that time, your average house um, in America, I would bet, is probably something like 50 plus, 5.0 plus. So you can see that's a significant reduction where, I mean, even in today, 14 years after I designed this house, 
there's people that get under one and think, oh my God, I just built the, you know, tightest house in the world. And no, there's other people that have done some pre pretty significant air tightness. But anyways, 0 0.60, that was our target. Right? So how did we achieve that? Well, one of the things, actually I'm going to go back here for a second, is when you look at this, one of the other aspects is, understand, we have our red line test or our air barrier. And our air barrier suggests that we build the air barrier continuous fashion. It's all interconnected systematic linkage, right? So that we maintain continuity, no exception. But there are areas where we have roofs, we have overhangs and such. So the reality is, is that you really want to build the red line test box and then add the superfluous stuff after, right? The porch roofs, the porch deck, all of that stuff should be outside our red line. You don't want that stuff penetrating our red line. And so when I go to a photo like this, and this is where our porch is uh, porch roof is meeting the house. Look at here, we have joist hangers and we have trusses here. Nothing penetrates. Through our air barrier. In this case here, our primary air barrier was the zip system at that time. And so all of our extra stuff gets applied to the outside, in this case, what I call the green box, which is basically our red line test because that is our primary air barrier, right? And then how do you test for this, right? At some point you have to sit there and say, okay, <clears throat> how do we know? How do we know we hit 0.6? So we do blower door tests, right? If you're not familiar with a blower door, you can see it's usually this red shroud has a fan and then it has a little peephole there so you can have a conversation with somebody on the other side of the shroud. But basically you put a fan in the house you either pressurize or depressurize. In a passive house, you do both because <coughs> you then have to take the average of the pressure test and the depressurization test. And that is your final number. Um, so you can see here, in, in this particular case here, the window manufacturer who is out of business, so I can speak as bad as I want and should about them. They were absolutely horrible and it took forever to get the doors. So remember, this is 2010 where we're building this. Zip is in its infancy, and we didn't know a lot about it. So I chose to chat with the builder and say, can we just go over all of the windows and then we'll test the zip box and we'll see if zip is really performing and can be the air barrier that <clears throat> I think it is, but they say it is, right? So we did that blower door test, and yes, we were at 25 CFM at 50 Pascals. I think with the, uh, what you call it, the green box, we were at something like 0.32 um, ACH 50. Um, something like that. It was a, a pretty incredible number. Um, and then we added some uh, insulation to the inside of it, and then that took that number down even more. We're going to get into the air tightness testing and stuff and all of those uh, numbers. But, hey, if you remember in episode number one, I uh, walked through, or episode two, I forget which one it was, but I walked through the number. So, anyways... Go check that out. Um, and then here, I just threw up some pictures. Again, you know, we, we have to be in the right perspective here. Uh, 2011 or 2010 when we're building this, 
um, I used a lot of Tremco acoustical sealant because as the architect, I made a promise to the homeowner that we were going to hit the 0.6. The builder made a promise to me and the homeowner that he would hit the 0.6. And that's the Valley Group. They're out of uh, down in Falmouth. Just a really great company to work with. Christian Valley, um, who I think is running the show now, um, just an exceptional guy. Can speak nothing but uh, very high of him. But you see, we have it there. We have it on the outside. So our rule was that we would use the acoustical sealant to seal the zip to the framing at all of our bottom plates, our top plates, and you can see here, around any opening. So basically we have the zip. The zip in the field gets taped, but it also gets acoustically sealed to the frame so that it is basically like a virtual OSB wrap on the house sealed to that frame. Now, <clears throat> the reason I use acoustical sealant is um, a lot of guys call it black death because it gets all over everything and it is some of the nastiest stuff. Once you get it on your fingers, or if you get it on a jacket or coat, you just throw it away because you're not getting it off. Um, but the beauty of things that are that nasty is it stays elastic for its whole life. Um, I had a friend um, a couple years ago that uh, knew I favored it, and he was replacing a few sliders that, I don't know, were probably near 30 years old where they used acoustical sealant back in the energy craft at homes days, and uh, sent me um, some information about it. But basically, when they removed the sliders, it was still the same black gooey stuff it was the day you installed it. It just never, ever, ever gets hard. It stays fully elastic for basically its lifetime. Um, so, anyways, that's episode number four of our PH11 series. Hopefully you're enjoying this. Um, you know, I know it's some effort to put a comment in there, but occasionally if you guys want to drop some comments and say, hey, Steve, I wish you talked about this or wish you talked about that or, you know, hey, I love the series, the way you're going, just some kind of communication so that I know, do I need to deviate in the future episodes? Do I need to add some additional information that maybe I didn't cover in these first four series? So um, I'm looking for your feedback. This is not a lecture series. This is a discussion series, but unfortunately the only discussion we can have is after the fact in comments. So unless you come see me at IBS or JLC or one of those places and then we can uh, talk it out. Until then, I'm Steve Basic Architect. This is the Vibe Board. You can find me on the Build Show Network or the Unbuild It podcast. And if you're looking for me on social media, yeah, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok. And of course, you found me here on YouTube and you know what I'm going to say. Go tell all your friends, tell them to smash that subscribe button. Yeah, that's episode four, folks. Until next time, long live our buildings.